Final Fight is a game that is remembered today as a game that would revolutionise the beat-em-up genre, offering players an experience that was a cut above anything else that had ever been seen before. The success of the arcade game would lead to a whole trilogy of games being released for the Super Nintendo. Whilst all very decent, none of which captured quite the same magic as the original arcade game. But today, we are not going to be looking at a title that tried to capture the spirit of what could be experienced in the arcades, but instead, a title that would present things completely differently. Mighty Final Fight is one of the most unique games in the Final Fight franchise, delivering an experience unlike any of the others. So today we are going to be looking at what separates this game from the pack, and why it is certainly worth being celebrated, as one of the greatest Final Fight games ever developed. I am the Top Hat Gaming Man aka Big Daddy Top Hat and this ladies and gentlemen is the mad story of Mighty Final Fight, the greatest home exclusive produced in the series. Yeah. But first, a word from our sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN, who are valuable to all of us in today's modern world of surfing on the world wide web, or going on adventures on that road we call the information superhighway. Like on any journey, we have to be careful and try our best to make sure we are all safe from danger. NordVPN keeps our data safe behind a wall of next generation encryption, protecting our online privacy even when traveling or using public Wi-Fi in cafes or restaurants. NordVPN makes hacking close to impossible. The service provides access to over 5,500 super fast servers across 60 countries, even working in China. If I want to watch Netflix shows not broadcast in my region, or get better prices on flights booked virtually from a different country, NordVPN has me covered. It is the only VPN to get all the green checks on PC Mag and is recommended by top technology experts such as Yahoo, Forbes, TechRadar and many more. The service is compatible with most operating systems including Windows, Mac OS, Linux, iOS and Android. It features a cyber security suite which acts as an ad blocker, up to six simultaneous connections and even double data encryption for increased anonymity with no data login. Buyers are protected with a 30 day money back guarantee and even given 24 seven customer support via live chats and emails. You can take advantage of this and get 70% off NordVPN today, thus meaning you only need to pay $3.49 per month with an additional month free. You can do this by using the link NordVPN forward slash Gaming or by using the promo code Topac Gaming. Privacy and security, yeah! After the successful release of Final Fight in the arcades in 1989, production of home conversions of the game were imminent. Two years later, in 1991, the Capcom System 1 game would see a release on the Super Nintendo, featuring scaled back graphics and many assets and features missing that were included in the arcade game, most notably a lack of two-player co-op, one of the arcade title's main selling points. The game was lacking reportedly due to tight constraints Capcom had when working with the 8 megabit ROM, meaning that content would sadly be cut to compensate. This would ultimately mean that over the period that better beat-em-ups could instead be found on the Sega Mega Drive, such as Golden Axe and Streets of Rage, both of which could offer gamers two-player arcade experiences. Moving through to 1993, rather than porting games to Nintendo hardware, Capcom would make the decision to build some Final Fight games from the ground up, bespoke to their systems. One of these was of course Final Fight 2, a Final Fight title modelled on the graphical style of the original that would offer two-player cooperative play this time around. But the other Final Fight title in the work simultaneously was a bit more quirky and different. Whilst it made sense to release a game on the Super Nintendo as the user base was growing forever stronger, Capcom was still releasing Nintendo Entertainment System games over this time frame too, as at this point in time, it was still the best selling home console of all time, and not all gamers had made the decision to upgrade from their 8-bit hardware as of yet, so there was still cash to be made developing new titles for this older platform. Now we already know that it was a struggle for Capcom to port their 1989 arcade game over to the Super Nintendo, so when it came to creating a Final Fight game on even weaker 8-bit hardware, Capcom would choose to develop a game featuring a very different graphical style to others in the series, that would try its best to play to the limited hardware strengths. So how did they do this you may ask? Well let's discuss. 
The most notable difference between this game and the other Final Fight games is the departure from the norm when it comes to the game's graphical approach. Usually within Final Fight games, characters are usually presented in a fairly realistic fashion, whereas in Mighty Final Fight's case, all character sprites are drawn in a comical childlike, super deformed art style, or a jibby art style as the Japanese call it. This means that the game graphically has aged fairly well considering that it was produced to run on such limited hardware compared to the main trilogy. The best way to describe the look of this game is that it looks like a member of the Kunio Kun series rather than Final Fight. Interestingly, the game does not form part of the narrative told within the Super Nintendo trilogy, nor is it a spin-off from the story either, but instead it seems to be a direct retelling of the tale featured in the original game where Mayor Mike Hager, accompanied by Guy and Cody, must save Mike's daughter, who has been kidnapped by the Mad Gear Gang. Although there are some amusing changes to the story to fit with the new art style. For example, Belga of the Mad Gear Gang's motives have changed from exerting revenge over Hager for clamping down on organised crime, and have instead shifted towards kidnapping Jessica because he became infatuated with her and simply wanted to get married to her. In terms of the three main characters who appeared in the arcade original, unlike the Super Nintendo game, all three of these gentlemen can be selected by the player on the character select screen in this one, in some ways instantly making this entry more appealing than its earlier 16-bit counterpart. Players in this game brawl their way through five main stages, each of which we shall discuss more about in a moment. But first, let's touch on the mechanics this game brings to the table. Sadly, in Mighty Final Fight, like the original SNES port, the game features no two-player co-op, meaning that only one player can fight their way through these environments at a time. Regardless of this though, Mighty Final Fight still manages to bring new features to the franchise other than just an amusing art style. Most notably the game's RPG mechanics that were implemented into the game. Believe it or not, characters can gain experience points in this one as they defeat enemies, which means players have the opportunity to level up as they progress. Experience points gained vary depending on how enemies are defeated, and which moves are used to gain victory. Basically, the use of stronger moves results in more points being awarded. Accumulating a certain number of these obviously means players can level up, increasing both their attack power and vitality. When players reach level 4 and above, they even receive additional special attacks, with new moves varying between each character. Speaking of the three characters, like in previous Final Fight games, their attacks vary, with Hager having a wrestling fighting style, Guy using ninjutsu, and Cody using a combination of karate and boxing. The experience points is not the only thing the game has in common with RPGs either, as players have the opportunity to interact with boss characters prior to fights even being given options with how you want to respond to them, delivering a touch more immersion. Other tropes return too, such as food to pick up to replenish health, along with weapons that can be found and wielded to do additional damage to foes. Speaking of the weapons though, due to possibly hardware limitations, each character can only use one weapon each. For example, Hagar has an oversized mallet like Triple Bloody H. In terms of the stages, they are bright and colourful, just what we would want from a game of this style really. The first stage is reminiscent of the opening stage from the Final Fight arcade game, in that it takes place in a dystopian street setting, featuring graffiti ridden buildings with smashed windows. Those with a keen eye may also notice that most of the enemy sprites in this game are jibby versions of those seen in the arcade game too. The opening stage though is not a recreation of the original, as soon the player ends up on a rooftop rather than heading straight into a building. The first boss in this game though is against the same character that featured in the arcade, Damned, or Thrasher as he was renamed for western audiences. Stage 2 sees players brawling their way through a park area, then later a nighttime quayside. Once again a backdrop similar to that of which appeared in the first game at some point. Chibi versions of famous character sprites such as Poison and Andor appear as opponents throughout the stage, culminating with a boss encounter against Sodom a man who has slowly become one of my favourite Final Fight characters, for the fact that he solely exists to make fun of weebs and Japanophiles, the kind of annoying people who try and correct my Japanese pronunciation in my comment section, whose knowledge of Japan doesn't go much past watching anime. You can all just sod them off. 
Stage 3 features further action as players must also avoid pitfalls in order to progress. Players end up in a building as the level continues and must also avoid rolling barrels as further obstacles. Players take on a boss opponent in a boxing ring similar to that of which Sodom appeared in within the prior game. There is then an industrial section to fight through, until eventually making it to a lift part of the stage, because as mentioned on this channel so many times before, it seems illegal to program a beat em up without including this exact bit of stage design. It gets put in literally every beat em up I have ever played. The lift brings players to a bar area offering some interesting background aesthetics such as flashing neon signs and drunk cards behind the action. Strangely, the boss fight of this stage is Sodom once again, because for some reason we're encouraged a lot to beat up weebs in this game. The next stage occurs on a mother freaking boat, a high quality one in fact. It even has sun lounges and swimming pools, the whole shebang. In the later part of the stage, a fight takes place against another fight with a pallet swap of Sodom, leading me to believe there must have been an anime convention going on locally in this game's world before finally taking on Belga, who is in a bionic form. Taking into account that he is built like freaking Robocop in this game, it makes me wonder whether we can consider this a pseudo sequel to the original game, as his bionic look suggests he has been mangled and defeated previously. But I will leave it up to you to decide in the comment section whether you think this game is a retelling of the original or a crazy sequel to the first game. Let me know down below. In regards to this game, as you can see it was a breath of fresh air from the rest of the series, at the very least, and certainly delivered an experience that was fantastic considering the basic hardware the game was programmed for. The more I look at this game though, the more I assume that this game was designed to captivate the Japanese market of gamers, with most of the titles features being tailored to their taste. What I mean by this is that everything about the game seems to suggest that this was the case. As far as I am aware, the Famicom remained popular in Japan for longer than the NES in the West. So firstly, one would assume the Famicom user base was more active. Secondly, the cutesy chibi art style is certainly something Japanese gamers would gravitate towards, rather than Westerners who generally prefer things edgier and cooler. And thirdly, the additional RPG mechanics this game offers, when you consider how popular games like Dragon Quest were in the nation. The game seems to have been made bespoke to appeal to that part of the world. But still, taking all of this into account, it translates as a fun experience no matter what the geographical location a player happens to be from. The game is unique and different to any of the other Final Fight games, delivering one of the best beat-em-ups 8-bit hardware has to offer. Is this the greatest home exclusive Final Fight game? In reality, probably not, mostly down to this game's lack of cooperative play an element that in my opinion is one of the most important when it comes to games of this archetype. In the classic era of the games, Final Fight CD probably delivers the best experience to players, and 2 and 3 are decent games that offer standard beat'em up affairs. But if gamers want to experience something completely unique and very different to anything else the series brought to the table, then Mighty Final Fight is the game I would bring up each and every time. In regards to the Final Fight series, we have now looked at the original trilogy, Mighty Final Fight and even Final Fight Revenge. So if you are yet to check out that video covering a year 2000 Sega Saturn Abomination, be sure to check it out. I guess this now just leaves me with Final Fight Streetwise to look at, which I intend to get to at some point. But in the meantime, I have plenty of content for you to watch covering all sorts of games from our rich history. These videos are possible due to the fantastic people who back this channel over on Patreon, who allow me to continue to produce this content on a full time basis. If you would like to receive some great incentives, such as early access to these videos and much more, then why not visit my Patreon page. Huge thank yous and shout outs go out to Sebastian Bellis, Carl Johnson, Hale Paulo Lopez, Joseph Rasmick, Doug Perkins, A Murder of Crows, Ego, Alephia Swanson, Angel Light 85, Sobby Quang DX, Aswell Rorakai, Brian Barry, Kamba Ramway 2, Carlos Domingos, Computer Man, Daniel Daly, ECU Professor, Evan Border, Gary Pinkett, Glennie Glenn, House of the Dead, Drop Grimbarella, Jordan Durant, Keith Ferguson, Matthew Robinson, Michael Cullix, Nick Daniels, Philip Manf, Prince Knight, Princess Zana, Rowan Dinched, Sponge Matt B, Timothy W. Haskins II, TOG Driver, Synth Spaces, Adam Castin, Adrian Hannington, Andis Reinsbergs, Andrew Bazansky, Andrew Pearson, 
angry little SOB, Antonio Rodriguez, Bernard NG, Bubba Kitty, Kalagni, Chris Fisk, Chris Margarine, Chris Cool, Craig Jenkins, Crazy Yarl, Dan Barlow Jr., Dan Van Dam, David Bell, Gregory Smoragewitz, Hans Christian, Instant Gratification, Mungie, Ivan M, James Bishop, James McDonald, JB, Jazzy Tay, Joel, John Bates, Casey Wright, Clangston Miller, Lewis Viant, Luke Canava, Marco Soto, Marvin Araliga, Master Jinx, Matthew Rindle, Me Machine Dean, Michael Hall, Mike Bruno, New Paul Elliott, Posty XL, Punky Dooster, Retroverse.com, Richard Stu Stewart, Rick 67, Ron Studd, Sarah Powell, Sarai, H. Al Sarai, Stephen Lewis, Timedall, Soundwave, Tom Elliott, They Mink, Renee, Wazzo Jugs, Zai. Thank you all so much for supporting this channel.